Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I think we got just about everybody logged in that's going to log in. I'm Elizabeth Kropinski. I am the co-director of the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our Improving Access to Quality Medical Care webinar series presented by the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center, the Arizona Telemedicine Program, and the Arizona Department of Health Services. Next slide. I'd like to extend a special welcome to everybody who's joined today's webinar, especially those from Arizona and those in our Southwest region. Next slide. Since uh, 2011, the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center has partnered with the Arizona Telemedicine Program to bring you uh, close to 200 informative webinars, uh, all of which are archived and available uh, on demand on our websites. And uh, since uh, 2020, we've been partnering with the, uh, uh, as I said, the uh, Arizona uh, Department of Health Services. Next slide. Now there's a couple rules and regulations. So as you join the webinar today, your microphone was muted. Um, and if you have questions, please use the chat function in Zoom to ask them and we will uh, get to them as we can at the end. And those that we can't get to, uh, we will get to afterwards and hopefully to uh, make the uh, answers available to everybody who registered. Uh, the webinar is being recorded uh, and you will have access to it uh, once we convert it. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, the URL will be listed uh, here on the slide. Uh, you can actually see it in chat later on as well. And this is one of the recordings. And if you follow the link, you can actually go and, and see uh, all of the webinars that we've had in the past. So next slide. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar. A uh, really great topic is the update uh, to the 2021 Evaluation and Management Guidelines. Um, and the presenter is Carol Yarborough. She's a healthcare compliance and reimbursement specialist. She provides a unique background uh, in legal technology, revenue management, clinical management at both the federal and state uh, regulations uh, for the past four years. She's actually contributed heavily to telehealth initiatives at uh, UC Health. Uh, she works hands-on with professionals, uh, fees and hospital-based fee professionals to implement billing strategies, which is incredibly important these days, especially in telemedicine and provides real-time feedback to clinicians regarding documentation and uh, staff with encounter guidance. Uh, she also trains CPT coding professionals at UC Medical Center in order to maximize uh, EMR workflow with greater documentation and coding. So without further ado, Carol. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and a big welcome as well to my my hosts, uh, Chris and Nancy, and um, the Arizona Telemedicine Program and the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so if you were with us back in November, um, the objectives give you a little bit of a deja vu feeling. Um, it's gonna be similar, but not quite the same. So our objectives, and not quite an agenda, is that you're going to learn about the duration of the current PHE, uh, the effect on um, physician fee reimbursement by CMS. And really, it's all about the originating site. It's all about the originating site. Uh, understand the 2021 AMA um, Office or other outpatient services e &M guidelines um, including the documentation guidelines, maximizing efficiency. And I really wanna go in again into the physician fee, um, physician fee schedule and its effect on those guidelines because that was um, quite, a, quite a, uh, a turnaround at the beginning of the year. And then we're gonna review possible scenarios for post PHE, just how you can continue um, you know, performing telehealth and making it worth your while now that you've done all this work. So uh, definitions and references, just so we're all starting at the same starting point. Uh, PHE is public health emergency. I've been told I tend to talk in acronyms and uh, secret reference words. So I'm hoping to lay them all out here. 
Um, so the PHE, we have a new deadline that was set January 21 plus 90 days. So we've got April 21 um, as our current, or our current extension of the PHE. Uh, on the next slide, I'm going to go into the letter to governors that was um, submitted by the um, interim secretary of HHS. Uh, AMA, American Medical Association. So we're going to go into the evaluation and management guidelines, which is your typical clinic encounter for uh, usually in an ambulatory setting, but we use the same codes for telehealth. Video visit, just a synchronous face-to-face -face provider and patient encounter, face-to-face. Uh, federal Register, um, this is the link to the final Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, it had a very interesting section on uh, remote physiologic monitoring that had been cut off and there was an update to that. Um, so at that same link, you're gonna find uh, the continuation of the RPM section that had been left off. So here's the PHE letter to governors. It was sent to all the governors of our, our states. Um, the PHE will likely remain in place for the entirety of 2021. Uh, and when a decision is made to terminate uh, the declaration or let it expire, we're gonna get 60 days notice. Um, the intent is to give predictability and stability. Um, a lot of the feedback I've heard is 60 days notice could be a little bit longer, like, you know, maybe 120 days notice would be better. Uh, it's really hard to reprogram people's minds and IT systems. Anyway, you can take a look at that letter at this URL. There's the, there are just a few things about the final rule because I love it so much. Um, so CMS gave a presentation on December 10th. Uh, Emily Yoder was one of the main speakers and she's really knowledgeable. Um, so they, they changed a few things about the final policies regarding evaluation and management, particularly with prolonged care. Um, I'm gonna go into those codes a little bit later, but briefly 99417 is a 15 minute time increment code based on the minimum of time that would denote a 99205 or a 99215. Um, CMS thought that would double count time because we could do the minimum of that and start adding the G2212, which, or the 99417, which would give us double the money for the same amount of time. So they went to the maximum uh, time when you add up all the time in in increments that apply to these codes now, and I'll get to that, don't worry. Um, they created a new code, surprise. Um, so yeah, they revised the times, still confusing. We'll, we'll display that later. And then revalued all the code sets. So I'll, I'll show you an example of that as well. Uh, the Medicare telehealth list, we have new permanent additions, hooray. Um, these are them. And uh, when you get the slides, uh, you can see the full definitions of these codes for uh, behavioral health and home visits and care planning. It's all good stuff. So how do they just go about and add a permanent set of codes without telling anybody or having anybody talk to them or anything? Well, they came up with uh, three categories of um, requesting or adding telehealth CPTs. Common procedural terminology, the codes we all know and love so much. Well, I love them. Um, so this took a little bit of digging. It's not very, um, it's not very obvious on their website where to find this information. But category one, so the ones that they added are category one codes, similar enough to what's already on the list that they just added them. So there we go. Category two, and I don't know why they called them categories. I wish they called them tiers or something like that. I feel like I'm talking about, you know, 
storm gradations, uh, services that are not similar to the current list. It, it'll include uh, an, an assessment. Does this, the service accurately describe the corresponding code? Can you do that full code description when it's via telehealth? Um, point, in, point in mind is uh, the, the um, outpatient physical therapy codes that we can now do during the PHE. As long as that physical therapist can perform the service that is the entirety of that description via telehealth, then they can bill that code. Category three. Service is likely to provide clinical benefit, yet lack clinical evidence. So um, these are all of the codes that have been added since the beginning of the PHE. Um, the first set of which appeared uh, to us overnight on March 30th, 2020. Um, so they're gonna remain in effect to the end of the calendar year in which the PHE ends. So it looks like we're talking about 2022 now in reality. So even if PHEN say January 5th, 2022, these codes will remain in effect. And this is to build in a little bit of transition and then also um, provide even more evidence to CMS whether or not there's a great clinical benefit in providing these services. Um, there are caveats um, that I'll mention in a second. I'm just trying to like build up the suspense for you by mentioning what's coming next with each slide. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at the current CMS telehealth list that they publish on their site. It's found in two places, uh, uh, the telehealth, website and with the finalized physician fee schedule. Um, so let's look at a code, 96161. So here it is, caregiver health risk assessment. Oh, well, it's a permanent code. Doesn't say it's only gonna, it's gonna end or anything like that, it's permanent. And what's nice is it could be uh, done audio only to meet the code definition. So that's a nice thing, but this is to show, this is category, once upon a time, it was category one. Uh, 99477, let's go up here. Initial day of hospital neonate care. Not too sure how many of those are CMS patients, but as we know, everything does trickle down to our Medicaid uh, rules. So it was nice that they added this one. It's a temporary addition for the PHE for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's gonna go away immediately when the pandemic ends. Like the PHE is over and it's just gonna, we can't bill it anymore. Now, the rest of these category three codes available through the year in which the PHE ends, they're gonna stick around. And then we're gonna assess whether or not this is going to be, um, you know, have clinical benefit. Hmm. I wish I could tell you what that I what those codes were. <laughs> Less than 1500 grams subsequent. I, I'll find the, the, if anyone really wants to know, I'll find the larger definition and look it up later. Okay, so when the PHE is over, that means all the 1135 waivers go away too. They're gonna to give us 60 days. So if the patient is in a HRSA eligible geographic location, I'll get to that, suspense, uh, it's gonna be reimbursed through the end of the year. So 99476 available up through the year in which the PHE ends is gonna be available for that whole year. It's not gonna be reimbursed the following calendar year unless you know, evidence says we should add this and make it a category one code or two. And at that time, it's gonna move over to permanent status and it's gonna be like our friend 96161. So uh, virtual supervision. Okay, I'm leaping away from the, the fee schedule. 
But these are uh, some very important tips that um, CMS mentioned in their December 10 presentation. So they re did revise the definition of direct supervision to include virtual availability of a supervising physician or practitioner, you know, in a teaching physician scenario. Um, this is going to continue through the end of the PHE or December 31st. So it's like, it's like category three. It's going to go through to the end of the calendar year. And they're going to see if um, it's going to become a permanent policy. Truth be told, I think it's a great policy. There's no reason why virtual supervision couldn't be done for certain clinical uh, scenarios. And of course, you know, it's up to the practitioners who are doing the, the service to to determine the efficacy and the safety of the, their patient while they're doing it, as always. Great, phone's ringing. I'll just put that over there. So uh, when the PHE ends, as I mentioned, the 1135 exceptions are no longer in effect. So homes are no longer going to be 100% eligible, um, unless, always a caveat, a uh, patient has home dialysis. They are uh, getting substance use disorder management visits, SUD, or uh, certain home health agency telehealth aspects are written into a care plan. Now, these telehealth aspects are not, um, they're not billable in and of themselves, but they can be used in a home, in an HHA uh, care plan. So, uh, as mentioned, you're not going to get billed for, say, doing re remote physiologic monitoring of that patient, but it's going to be written into the care plan so that it's a viable thing that you can use to take care of that patient. Uh, the HRSA payment eligibility analy analyzer will be back in effect. This is the URL where you can check out those fabulous addresses of the, the rural uh, proper eligible sites like a clinic or a hospital or, you know, anything that's not the patient's home, I guess. Um, it has to be a business. And then uh, really it's, we need an act of Congress to extend reach of the originating site to urban sites and homes. Um, the exception to that is stroke is still gonna be available in urban emergency departments. Uh, the stroke, stroke, telestroke services, meaning, you know, if you can get TPA administered within the first 30 minutes, you're going to, you're going to offset all the negative um, aspects of a stroke. But um, I just greatly encourage everyone to um, talk to your representatives, talk to your senators, talk to your, uh, your local government about whether or not uh, you can get them to all hold hands and talk about uh, changing the legislation that restricts uh, telehealth to urban sites. I did that last week. I got to talk to a uh, uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Nancy Pelosi's um, health policy person. Okay, new finalized policies. No change. We, you know, change is good, but I'm not fine with it happening all the time. I don't know. It's I never was. It's not due to my age. Um, the expansion of the types of practitioners who may provide communication technology-based services. Now those are CTBS. Those are communication technology-based services. Those aren't really telehealth, according to CMS. Um, so CTBS is like an e-visit. And so they've extended e-visits to uh, quali non-qualified health practitioners, meaning it's been extended to providers who maybe can perform things incident to, or if they have their own NPI and they can regularly bill uh, CMS, they can use these e-visit codes that are specific to them aside from the folks who can build E&M codes. Uh, frequency limitation on nursing facility visit. 
auxiliary personnel, remote monitoring services. And so let's not get into RPM, but this involves incident too. So that's something to talk about at a later date. Uh, clarifying the definition of a medical device. Uh, that is, you know, it, it didn't change. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's still confusing a little, but we've got the definition. Teaching physicians and residents, uh, this is more finality. Yay. Um, key portion is service using audio, video, real-time communication technology. So that's nice. Now there are certain services that will go away at the end of the PHE um, in terms of what can be supervised. Primary care exception, you don't need an attending to do time-based billing. If you've, I think, seen patients under supervision in a primary care practice for at least six months. And then after that, you're free, free of that attending. Okay, telemental health caveats. Um, we have a new bill and it added critical access hospitals, small rural hospitals, eligible for reimbursement. Um, it expanded uh, telehealth where access is a challenge. It eliminated geographic restrictions for mental health treatments, allowing patients to be treated in their homes, but they want you to initiate care with an in-person visit and have uh, periodic in-person visits. So it's kind of a mixed bag. It's good, but not so good. I mean, but again, it depends on what kind of practitioner you are. Okay, PFS, what it means. I'm just talking a lot here. Shenanigans. All right, the conversion factor. The conversion factor is what is multiplied per each relative value unit to give us the amount of money we get paid from CMS. Relative value unit, I guess it's like percentiles. Like, so I am getting a splinter removed and relative to getting a nail driven into my foot because I stepped on it, that might be a higher relative value unit for the nail than the splinter. And so I get paid more for this as a provider. Well, the providers get paid more. I don't get paid anything, I pay a copay. Um, and then the relative value unit for this relative to this is lower. So this is how Medicare keeps budget neutrality and what they're paying us. So they're, they're always weighing stuff against the other. And that's that's what I mentioned at the beginning of what they did with the ENMs. They kind of played around with them a little bit. Anyway, last year we were getting paid over $36 per relative value unit. So, you know, something that was three RVUs times 30, 36. That was reduced to $32 this year. That was horrible. So we all recalculated um, Neridian, our, our Mac. They calculated all their fee schedules and put them up on the website for us to just grab them without having to do the calculations ourselves. And then this, this announcement came out on um, January 7th. So it said, okay, well, we're gonna actually increase the Medicare physician fee schedule payments for calendar year 2021. And this was due to the, the hardships uh, we, we faced in collections and performing care in the last year. And so what that 3.75 did was raise that up to $34.90. So it, it was at 36, went to 32, now we're back up to about 35. Um, they based this on the geographic, so the WPGC, <laughs> the geographic practice cost index. So they had taken away that 1.0 floor, like the 1.0 per geographic index allocation had been taken away. So everything kind of just went through the floor. They reinstated that. And then all their RVUs had to be right, recalculated. 
So, so be careful. If you've downloaded the, the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule, make sure you've downloaded the, the most recent one. So um, in December 2020, I downloaded this. And so let's say non-facility work RVUs, 2.13 in December, 2.12 in January. Uh, 99212 was a 1.67 in December. No, and this is all for 2021. This is the maddening thing about it. So you gotta be careful. It went down to 1.63. So as a practice manager, or you know, you're trying to figure out your budget for your clinical FTE, anything, how many MAs can I hire? Make sure you've got the right RVU um, thing available to you thing. <laughs> it's addendum B. Um, and just so you don't have to calculate that, Neridian miraculously recalculated and it is back up on their website. So it's ready for you. So um, where am I at? 1127. I'm going to go a little faster here because we all know this already, right? Use time or MDM. 99201 is gone. We're done. Just kidding. Um, again, to reiterate, what, what type of clinicians are in your practice? Uh, you're going to have a mix. Uh, people that have are habitual, uh, depending on their types of patients, pair mix, whatever. Time is going to apply in certain instances, and medical decision making is going to apply. Um, also, adult or pediatrics, is it one where you talk a lot? Um, how does a provider correctly document these visits? Uh, there's a mix. Um, it's something to think about. So um, I did get asked yesterday by a psychiatrist who said, I have a colleague who likes to um, copy and paste everything over still. Um, the whole reason we went to the 2021 guidelines is so that people like me, a coder, doesn't have to tick off all these little bulleted things on an audit sheet to determine your level of service. Now I either look at total face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -face time, I'll get to that, or uh, the problems presented and the risk associated with that for medical decision-making. We really don't care about what happened last month, only what's happening today and maybe how last month's stuff in the last visit affected what's going on today. Please don't copy and paste. We're getting rid of note bloat. So um, it'll be great when this all expands over to inpatient and everything else, but um, inpatient, progress notes, those types of evaluation and management visits, emergency department, um, not emergency department. The same rules apply for emergency department. We don't do emergency department based on time, but um, progress notes, everything. So you spend over 50% of which was spent counseling coordination of care. It's only face-to-face -face time. Now, this is total time, and it's just these codes. So the Federal Register changed the total time, and this is why, I don't know, I was, I'm confused about it a little bit. So the, the RUC, the Use Committee of the AMA, um, recommended that there are different times to add together for each level of CPT code. Pre-service time for a low level 99202 is two minutes, and then you're gonna spend 15 minute face-to-face, -face, and then maybe another three minutes documenting. Um, so that's 18, let's see, two plus 15 is 17, plus three is 20. The, R, the RUC recommended 22 minutes. <laughs> and so, like total time. So CMS said, well, we want to use actual total time. And I think what the RUC was trying to do is that in the AMA CPT book, uh, copyright registered, 
there are time durations associated with each of these codes now. Uh, in the olden days, said, okay, uh, 99202 takes about 15 minutes. Now it's like we have actual total time they want to assign to this or time parameters. And they did, they, they did this actual total time, harken back to those prolonged care codes uh, that I mentioned, 99417, GD212, or G2212, and, um, and that whole minimum max thing. And so they changed it. And this is what we have now. So before, okay, in the olden days, let's let's go with a level four. No, let's go with a level five. Let's mix it up. I'm picking on 99202 too much. So before it was 67 minutes, typical time associated with a 99205 new patient to me and my clinic and my practice visit. Um, in the interim, final rule comment, they allowed us to use the time, uh, time and MDM only during the PHE um, up until 2021 so that we could build just based on time or MDM. Didn't have to have all those elements of the PH, uh, physical and all that stuff in there um, because it was too confusing. Because I think I don't think CMS or anyone really knew what these time things were going to shake out to be. So the proposed final rule said um, 85 minutes. So you see here, here's this time duration here. Proposed final rule, 60 to 84 minutes, and then 85 minutes was the total time of a 99205, or at least. So where was the maximum or minimum of that? I I don't know. Federal Register now says uh, 61 to 88 minutes, whereas the AMA has in their book 60 to 74. So I think for CMS and Medicaid, you would wanna go with CMS's prolonged care time uh, admonition to bill, uh, to document over 88 minutes. So document your 88 minutes or whatever, 90 minutes round up, and then your additional 15 minutes for that, for the additional prolonged care. Um, the, the onus they have with 98417 is that you could base it billing off of the 60 minutes here and they want the maximum. It's, it's still unclear. It was, it was unclear. I think that the, more clarification is going to come out this year. So they're not paying for 99417. They don't like that minimum, re, minimum required time of the primary procedure, which is 61 minutes or 60. They want the maximum. So they create a G2212. Surprise. So it's an only the maximum number of minutes associated with the highest level of ENM code for outpatient. And it has all these other caveats in here, like don't report it with that and don't do that. So we're gonna add it all together. You're gonna list total time and describe what activities were done. It's not a big thing, like just general. I spent 45 minutes, I spent an hour and a half I reviewed labs, I saw the patient, I did this. Um, for prolonged time, I spent 120 minutes caring for this patient today, reviewing labs, da da da. So you bill a 99215. Let's see if I did it right. Top of which, aha, 70 minutes. There it is, the maximum, not the minimum. So I spent 70 minutes and then I built a G2212 times two, because each of those is 15, it equals 115 minutes. But I spent 120, what about my five minutes? You gotta eat it. Cannot bill in any of the uh, increments or over half of which, like in other CMS uh, time codes, you can, if, if you get over half of the allotted time, you get to bill it, not this. 
because you're getting a lot of leeway here. You're, you're doing all that non face to face stuff and um, 99354. Don't report them anymore with outpatient ENM. Do report them with everything else that you used to and that you still, you know, what you, what you would before. 99358, that was that prolonged care, non face to face in association with an outpatient ENM. You can't do it on the same data service, but you can still report it. Um, I did question CMS about what other codes you could report it with too. And they said you could do it with any other ENM. Like, say you have an inpatient uh, beneficiary and you spend two hours in preparation to go in and see them. You did a prolonged review of records. 99358 plus 59. I make it sound so easy, right? Let's, let's try writing a note. Split shared. Um, again, you're gonna add up all the time, just like you used to. Only distinct time should be summed up. If you're jointly meeting, only one person gets to bill. Okay. So what's in total time and what isn't? All the stuff in the yes column, yes, that, that counts. Everything in the no column, just because you're a slow typer, slow dictator, doesn't count. Anything done on a separate date? Oh, if I did it on a separate date, I could build 98358, get 2.10 RVUs. So here's an example based on time. I spent 45 minutes caring for this patient. Look at this tiny little note. And I, I borrowed this from Pete Jensen, EM University. It's delightful. I let him know I borrowed it. He hasn't responded. Um, look at this tiny, look, look at this history. I'm tired. Only three ROS. Well, that would just put you right down to a level whatever in the olden days. But, this is a 99215. Oh, AMA states 99215. Hmm, falls within the time span of a 99213. You know? Better to rely on the documentation for this patient. So you're going to be looking at medical decision making. You're going to be looking at Valsartan sleep study. So as prescription drugs and a diagnostic study not that urgent, return to clinic in three months. I would say it's a level four. We can argue about that because I like to. MDM, I, I really am talking too much. Um, three components, not a new concept. Number and complexity of patients. But it, that is different. No longer new established worsening. The amount of data has been improved. Risk of complications, risk of complications. Like if you even talk about a surgery, that's high risk. So it's potential outcomes that is you're taking into account because it's all this, you're assessing risk to the patient. So that's pretty cool. It, it just makes more sense to me this way. The old way is still for everything else. So here you're presenting problems, old, new, you're gonna get the slides, don't worry. Data then, data now, data better. Uh, before, if I reviewed an imaging study or ordered a clin lab, I only got a max one point for each. Now I get to multiply it three times one equals three. So I get to order three labs and have it count towards uh, my data element. This will make sense to coders. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into this. I'm thanking Stephanie Scott at Healthy City. She did this really nice chart. It's, it's a great tool for coding. Risk table, uh, this is just a portion of it that usually would equal in a 99204 or 99214, moderate risk. So it's risk, we're assessing risk. Um, combination of three tests, interpretation, discussion of management or test, risk of or morbidity. So you, you, we got our prescription, prescription drug management again, which is why I gave that one a level four. Love that. Minor surgery, elective major surgery, 
Oh, diagnosis or treatment significantly limited by social determinants of health. So if I have someone who's homeless and I want them to put their foot up for the next two days because they sprained their ankle, that's going to complicate things. That's going to put you at moderate. So here are your uh, social determinants of health codes. And, you know, we're all talking about health equity, social determinants of health, especially in this last year with all of the events of the summer and during the PHE. Um, these are really great to document. I think they'll be fabulous for reporting circumstances and for um, reaching out to patients that, um, that are in groups instead of you know, trying to determine like, oh, how many visits did that person have to the ED? Well, it could be because they're, uh, you know, somebody who's middle class and they have a lot of things and they don't have health insurance or they're homeless. And every time we try to help them, they can't put their foot up, you know, so it's, it's going to help sort those things out. Put it all together, QD data and risk. Voila, you have your code. Time or MDM. So again, I'm thanking Pete. Here's the, here's our Val, uh, Valsartan. So we got prescription drug management, return to clinic. You know, he's ordering two diagnostics. Um, it's not very urgent, but it's moderate risk. You know, we've got stable hypertension. Anything can set me off lately. All right, where do I find all this again? Right here at this URL, the two downloads you want to worry about is this final rule addenda and the Medicare telehealth services, all right here in purple for you. You don't need anything else unless you're an ESRD provider. Go. So think back to slide eight. You're in your clinic. You're a manager. You're a provider. Uh, can the provider legitimately track time or are they going to document 28 hours in an eight-hour workday? Um, don't document the same number of minutes for every patient. Uh, yeah, be reasonable. Um, MDM, complexity, data, and factors. So what's going to work for, for you? You've got two options now. Here are the resources. Um, here's that key topics where I, I borrowed those slides from Emily and her friends. Um, here's the AMA guidelines tutorials on time and MDM, my AAPC audit tool, which I love. We all need helpers. And I'm done. We have time for questions. Yes, we do. Thank you. That was wonderful. And we actually do have a lot of questions. We're try, we're gonna, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, so starting out, is medication management by nursing reimbursable by Medicare? No. Okay, that was a quick and easy answer. <laughs> okay, but you know, you can you can you can integrate that into the over. So it depends on which clinic you're in. If you're um, a non-facility, you can use that indirect type of patient care and add it into your medication management for your overall evaluation and management level of service. If that RN is in a facility that would go towards the, the facility service, the G0463 that is built with an E&M. Okay, and just to verify, uh, once PHG is gone, CMS will not recognize the home as a place of reimbursement. True. Unless your patient right. is ESRD, SUD, or and certain psych, um, treatment. Okay. Can you clarify, is the rurality, rurality, that's a hard word to say, is the rurality rule lifted for billing telemedicine technical fee? Rurality rule, yes. Um, if we can, if you can put down your email address, let's follow up on that. That um, the RHCs and FQHCs are allowed to bill telehealth services and act as a distance site right now. Okay. Do you have any additional information for MACs 
or where can they find it? MACs, Medicare Administrative Contractors, Neridian. Mm -hmm. um, there are five major MACs. So um, just Google Neridian, Arizona, and it's going to come up with your jurisdiction. I believe um, California's jurisdiction E. Um, I think Arizona is F, maybe F, but you'll find it. Okay. And you've got those URLs right there too. Great. I think you. I think you already provide. The, somebody's asking, will you have a summary by the various categories of codes with definitions? For example, video visit equivalent of face-to-face, uh, -face, applicable in CHH rolls up codes, expires, etc. Do you have a quick and dirty summary? I think you provided a lot of summaries, but is there is there one place do you think that kind of summarizes everything, or do your slides kind of cover that? Um. There's a fact sheet that CMS published that has all of that on it. And then there's also an FAQ. So type in CMS FAQ COVID-19. And that'll come up and all of those coverages are explained what goes away, what stays, what facility fee you can bill. Great, thank you. Is there a difference for freestanding clinics versus provider-based? I th they're this. I think they're the same thing. So freestanding clinic is places service eleven, and so um, provider-based clinic versus provider-based department, which would be places service um, nineteen or twenty-two. Perfect. Thank you. you no, know, it's nomenclature. It doesn't make sense. Non-facility. A rose Stand is up. a rose. Yeah. <laughs> Would we put an EM code for telephone visit that's less than 10 minutes? Uh, you would bill the G2012 code for that with the time parameters that, uh, that you're allowed. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, you were talking, you had a, a slide where you're talking about RVUs and it seemed to have confused a few people. Oh, it's, yeah, I did my, I've done my job. What can I say? <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's, let's answer RVU questions. Do I need to go uh, back to that slide or I'll just answer the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was basically people said they were a bit confused and could you, you know, try to explain it maybe in a different way. Okay. So the relative value units are the, like the units they determine what you get if, say you're doing a cornea surgery. It used to be valued at f like 15 RVUs because it used to be really hard and awful and, you know, head, you'd have to stay in bed for two weeks. Now people do um, lens replacements all the time. So the value of that decreased as people got better and better at it because they could do more and more and they got, you have to keep budget neutrality with uh, the Medicare, um, God, what, what's it called? Uh, the fund. So as this came down, other services could go up. So what they did with these RVUs here is they, they want to start loading evaluation and management because that's about 70% of what we bill anyway. Um, you know, they're, they're lower valued than total hip replacement, or even a cornea nowadays. But they wanted to give value to this um, because of this, this time and MDM factor uh, so that primary care providers are starting to make more money. So they just played, I mean, they went, they played around with it. They, they did lower the RVUs, but then they increased the conversion factor which is what they calculate. So these values, <laughs> crazily enough, the values went down 
but the conversion factor went up. So basically you're making the same amount of money. Okay, so, somebody had a follow-up to that and they were talking about um, that they thought the RVU changed, but not the time. And so they're asking, so are we back to two sets of times? You know, I'm confused about that and I promised to follow up. I researched it uh, the last couple of days. I had an argument with a friend of mine yesterday about it. Um, Pretty much people are saying, go with the AMA CPT book for your commercials. Uh, the, the, yeah, there are two sets of time. Okay, here's an interesting question. So somebody's doing coding for a pediatrician practice in an FQHC. Sometimes the provider needs to discuss behavioral and other issues with the parents without the patient present. What do the 2021 guidelines say about this? Are those visits billable? Yes, because it's not face-to-face -face time. Okay. A um, little bit off topic, but should a telehealth consult from one of our hospitals to another be billed as in-person or telehealth? We have heard that this would be considered on campus and not qualify for telehealth. Is this accurate? According to CMS, yes. So in those FAQs, they did say if you are on the site and you're seeing a patient that's admitted, you bill it as a regular progress note. If you are at home, that's telehealth. Okay. I think it's just because of the, the PHE. I, I mean, this is certainly only in effect during the PHE. Mm -hmm. Conserve travel, conserve uh, exposure. You're not moving from one hospital site to another, potentially exposing, mm -hmm. carrying stuff around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, can I interrupt with a, there's a, another person asked a very, a very similar question. Um, when is telemed billable as telemed if the patient is on the other side of the wall, on the other side of the campus, or are on another campus across town owned by the same entity, um, I know that if they're in the same building, it would be called an in-person service, even if they were using telemedicine tech. What if it is, you know, say 10 miles apart, but it's the same entity? I know there's been a lot of discussion on that with CMS, but I don't know what they finally decided or if they ever even really gave a final answer. I'm just going with the rule if we're the same, if we have privileges, at all of our campuses, and if we're privileged, if, if your provider is privileged, I think it's the same as if you were there in person. Seems, it seems like a safe bet, yeah. It's, yeah, I don't know how they're gonna audit that, even if, you didn't hear me say that, but I don't even know how, whether they're gonna look at our IP addresses, I don't know. But I don't know, I mean, if as long as you're logging into you know, the, the service location of where your patient is. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's a, just a regular thing. And then you've got your, your resident or your whatever. Now, what you have to do and be careful about is like the time on the floor. You know, when you're, when you're coding inpatient progress notes, they, they allow you to bill by time, even if you don't see the patient because you have time at bedside or time on the floor. Mm -hmm. What's the definition of floor now? Is it the floor of all your buildings or is it the floor of where the patient is? I kind of think it's the floor where the patient is, but this is why we love, you know, coding and billing. <laughs> all right. Uh, how is it determined if a provider is slow in charting? And I guess what, how slow is slow and what is slow? <laughs> I'd say you could benchmark if some, you know, you got 10 providers and they all can chart within five minutes and you got an outlier, it takes 20. Okay. Yeah. A couple questions about time. So what are the CMS times for EM codes and for time-based coding? When do we consider the times on the before and after the face-to-face -face visit? Do we do pre-visit planning before we see the patient? Most of the time this is being done at least a day before the appointment. Will that be counted? No. 
It's only non-face-to-face -face services you do within a 24-hour period. So if you do your pre-charting and you do any kind of uh, non-face-to-face preparation, you may meet the requirements of that 99358 code. I think it just passed it. Yeah. It's not on the same data service, but it's still reportable. Um, first hour. I read in the Federal uh, Register two years ago, light reading, that they want you to have a whole 60 minutes on this. Uh, Neridian has said over half in an FAQ. So if you spend, I guess, up to an hour doing your pre-charting work, yeah, I'd say as close to an hour as you can get to make it. Mm -hmm. You can bill that 99358. Okay. We got a ton of questions, so we're not gonna get to all of them, but uh, we will try to get to them afterwards. And like I said, send out responses, but maybe like one more or two. Uh, struggling with nurse visits. Uh, okay. to schedule, for example, for blood pressure checks or INR measurements. How do they handle those? In terms of telehealth? In, in tel yeah, so blood pressure checks and INR measurements via telehealth. There are INR codes that are reportable via telephone. So we can answer that one offline as well. And then blood pressure checks, um, there are the remote physiological monitoring codes that are pertinent to a specific time period for a certain condition where you wanna monitor the patient. And the RN can add time into that 20 minute increment, say for a 99457, which is evaluation analysis and communication with the patient of um, the data collected uh, pertinent to someone's, say, blood pressure, automatically transmitted and uploaded from a Bluetooth device, FDA approved or FDA defined, <sighs> et cetera, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So if you're in a, <laughs> if you're in a standalone clinic, uh, you can use that RN time to contribute to that 20 minutes. If you're in a facility, you can't. That's got to be all uh, all NPI billable time. NPI national all, provider. Right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. We let's do one more. Yeah. Why meds, not? It, meds management. Patient okay. has been on insulin or some other medication for a while. They come in for a refill, refill, and the dosage has not changed. Does this still qualify as a nine nine two one four for risk? Yeah, yeah, because you had to weigh the benefits of increasing, decreasing, and 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 seeing whether or not what what, what the outcome is going to be. If you met, if you messed up and changed it, patient could get ill. Okay, well we got. But I'll argue Let's with anyone on that. Put in your email address. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we got less than 10 questions, but like I said, we got one minute, and I don't think we can do speed dating on this. Yeah. Uh, so you want to zoom ahead to the last few slides. Uh, so we do want to uh, thank everyone, especially Carol. This has been just awesome. Uh, a lot of information there and made mud just a little bit clearer on some stuff. Yes. Um, so... <laughs> As I said, this uh, presentation has been brought to you by the Arizona Department of Health Services, the Arizona Telemedicine Program, and the Southwest TRC. For upcoming webinars and events, please go to our website Oops. there. And as always, we strongly value your opinion, so please do take a few minutes, complete our online survey there, and uh, as you exit, you'll be taken directly to the short survey. So thank you all very much. And Carol, again, thank you. This has been absolutely wonderful. And uh, we will try to get the answers to some of those other questions out to everybody uh, as soon as we can. Yeah, definitely. You're welcome. And um, thank you for spending your time with me today. I appreciate it.